Hey guys, and welcome to a reboot, Mega Basing 101 reboot of our previous series. I am joined by the same two guys. Hello. Greetings. And uh, we're we're taking a different different kind of angle at this series. So we got some some really good feedback uh, from people over the episodes, and it was not really going how you guys wanted. It was not really going how we wanted. Uh, with kind of just the boring, more of a let's play, trying to be workshop math series, which... Uh, Doing it all wrong math series. Yeah, so we've changed it up, rebooting it, and we're going to do more of a tour of bases, tour of mega base builds, and explain the concepts and thinking behind them rather than a let's play um you know where we grind out all the materials and do all this boring stuff on camera um so we're starting out actually in my single player sending supporters to space map uh which is pretty much completed at this point and then we may move on to mojo's base and other bases uh and kind of just show the comparisons differences and such but we have some questions some people asked i've written down here to cover um, in regards to mega bases, so uh, the first one, I guess, the main one is is with smelting because that's your building block. Uh, you know, and the question essentially was, do you have a central area for smelting all ores, or separate for each ore type? So, kind of, if you remember the zero fifteen simulation, that would be an example of a smelting area for all ores. I would imagine. One, we call that one big central smelter. I was just thinking too. That's probably one of the most um, divisive topics is what you do with the smelting. Yeah, and uh, there were quite a few debates in the comments and and stuff about do you do central smelting, do you do on-site smelting outposts, which is kind of the second question that was proposed here. Um, so, we'll start here, I guess, by just kind of exploring and demonstrating. Uh, so, we're in some helicopters here for easy access. Uh, this particular map uses obviously central smelting areas, but segregated for the e for each resource. So we have iron here in the middle, we have copper here on the left, and then steel here on the right, um, opposed to all of them in, in just one. And uh, I would say there's definitely some benefits to kind of separating them out like that. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts in regards to that? It's funny, I didn't actually realize you had the steel separated completely through, all the way through this map. I only just noticed today. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was, um... I was hoping yeah. to, to cover, like, pros and cons, and why would you choose to do each method? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, if you want to start out with pros and cons and why you would choose one over the other. Well, one of the major reasons is, is definitely lag. You want to, at least a lot of us, try to maintain, you know less CPU time dedicated to bot travel or something. So that's why we we do stuff like this where we have small dedicated uh, bot network for each, you know, subsection. If you do something like a smart smelter that takes in all materials and outputs X number of each depending on demand and such, it, that seems like a really clever way of doing it. But unfortunately, the size of the bot network you got to have to accomplish that is massive. And that's not really good for your CPU. No, especially on a mega base scale, too, which I think is a, a, an important uh, thing to maybe differentiate. You know, on a small little base, you know, or, or even a medium sized base, that can be, you know, fun to play around with and stuff. But on a mega base scale, which, you know, again, is what we're trying to, uh, you know, teach here is that's when it becomes a major issue like Zuri mentioned on that size of a base and scale you you can't really get away with that without just completely destroying your your game performance which as we mentioned before is kind of your most important resource at that point almost yeah it's the most important resource resource of a mega base Joe it actually brings up another interesting point because we used to use smart smelters and big block smelters and a year ago, you know, the, the size of a mega base was considerably smaller. And that's, I think, where ultimately where what's changed and why the big block smelters have fallen out of favor. That's because uh, the mega base scale has exceeded what's um, possible with that sort of uh, smelting arrangement. Exactly. Um, 
and I'm just flying over to Steel here to kind of demonstrate this as well. Uh, just another quick mention here uh, that I think we were kind of trying to talk about a little bit uh, before in the other map is uh, you'll notice that this is actually taking in ore directly to make iron plate and then inserting the iron plate into the steel um, rather than having dead like iron smelters that just make iron and then trying to transport the iron plate to a different smelter to do steel um, that can get kind of convoluted and is almost it's like double the amount of bots because you're having to you know do all the iron stuff in the iron smelter deliver it and then have bots move everything again in the steel smelter in the case of the omni smelter i know a lot of people that have had a lot of difficulty dealing with switching from steel to say iron plate or copper plate mm -hmm. and stone bricks don't forget stone bricks oh yeah stone bricks too yep <laughs> so uh so yeah this is a kind of you know this is why we have these segregated, um, you know, copper, iron, steel, uh, especially, on, like I said, on this scale, trying to do this all in one uh, w would just be an absolute nightmare and really probably not, not worth any convenience you may gain from it. And, and also uh, this smelter separated from the other smelters by a significant distance too compared to like the sim map where everything was combined and the sim map for that thousand science a minute that was getting to the point where having a one big block smelter of individual bot networks was becoming unwieldy mm -hmm. uh, i know we yeah. certainly had to deal with the train pathing um challenges <laughs> yeah the train pathing challenges are definitely real which i guess can kind of bring us maybe to another thing which we we really tried to discussed fairly extensively in uh, previously but didn't actually get to demonstrate it but it's already built and demonstrated here is um, Azure you were talking quite a bit about the kind of separated uh, dedicated rail networks rather than just one huge main line yeah independent ore lines and then plate lines or intermediate product lines to outposts as it were yeah, so to kind of demonstrate that, um, on my map, I'm just looking down below to start with the ore lines, um, is we do have separate, uh, separate ore lines. So there's actually one, uh, one dedicated ore line just for the iron ore to the steel. Uh, now, depending on the size you're building, you could make this the same line for the uh, ore for iron, uh, but at this scale, I wanted it separate. Um, and then there's an entirely separate line which is only connected via PAX lines for the iron, and then yet another separate line for the copper, rather than um, trying to put all those trains on the just one main line that's gonna be overly crowded. Um, and kind of on top of that, is you'll notice these lines that we're flying over are their own dedicated lines on a per smelter block basis. Um, now I'm doing a little bit of a different weird um, switching system. You don't have to do that, but the concept of having um, these dedicated lines on a per smelter basis can uh, help solve the train pathing challenges that Mojo mentioned we faced and that you may face as well. Yeah, this is quite a, um, I guess I could say elegant solution to the problem of getting trains to the individual builds is instead of getting the ore all the way up into the smelters, get them to an, a transfer point where you can have the transfer points close, to each, close enough to each other that it's not an issue and that you can increase train throughput. This still seems inelegant to me. I still think I can do a better. Oh yeah, we, we can. I think we can certainly improve on the, the that no pathing thing. I would um, I would be interested. Maybe we can cover that later in the series. I would be very interested to see a solution you guys come up with because through all of my tests, um, the trains were still dumb without any of these smarts and making them no path. They would still only path to one or two stations. Sure. Well, if there's interest, leave a comment or something, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I'm definitely interested uh, to see an alternative solution that avoids the train pathing problems. Um, but moving on from that, I guess uh, another topic that was quite widely uh, kind of debated in the comments was on-site smelting versus central smelting. And we already kind of discussed that, but just to show... Uh, looking at the map here, it, it would be very difficult, I would imagine, on on this sort of scale to 
do on-site smelting, if you just look at the sheer amount of ore patches that are required to support this, and the rate that they're consumed, and, and that was the main point that, that you guys, that one of you, I think it was Zuri made, uh, about having to pick everything up and move it each time the ore patch runs out, is, uh, it, it, I mean, you can just look at all these ore patches. If you imagine trying to have smelters built at every single one of them and then having to pick up and move them every single time an outpost runs out. And then, you know, what if the next outpost you get is only half the size of the one you just tore up? Then you need to then take what you tore up and put it in two different outposts. Yeah, that was definitely my complaint. I think that comes back to, again, the scale where if you look back, say, to like when... Same with the um, the Omni smelters, big block smelters, um, where like a year ago in like or in version twelve, that was that was fine because you know uh, what, I'm trying to think of Colonel Will's mega base, its sort of production levels where that was like whoa, that's huge, and that's like barely idle on this map. Yeah, it's and that's really where advanced. yeah, and that's where on-site smelting is still fine because it, you're on a scale that's small enough where it still works mm -hmm. you know you're, you're only you know you might only produ be producing 800 science a minute right um which used to be huge yeah <laughs> uh so another really interesting kind of question that was proposed to cover is uh planning and this goes into what we were trying to to really aim at for the series is how to actually build up to a mega base is do you plan the rest do you plan your smelters first and the rest of the base around them or do you plan your smelters around the rest of your base and i guess that comes down to personal preference um in my experience i found it far easier to make your smelters first since that's kind of your start point and then plan the rest of your base around those rather than vice versa. Yeah, generally they're so big that um, you'll build everything else around them because they'll dominate the landscape. There's only two ways to play, really. Either you plan everything out and bust out your spreadsheets and, and you know, section things off, or you'll wing it and fix it. Yeah, and, and I mean, either one can work. If you enjoy the fixing part, then, then that uh, may be your way to go. And, uh, let's see here. So, I guess we could actually look a little bit more into the dedicated rail thing, because this is important. Again, I keep referring back to the 015 sim, because I think a lot of people watch that, and it was a very good example of what happens when you try to congest everything onto one uh, main line. And uh, there were major training problems. There were constant backups, constant issues with throughput. Um, but I'm flying over to the production of all the circuits, uh, because this is where these segregated rail networks were really utilized to eliminate a ton of train traffic on the main line. Uh, because all the green circuit, red circuit, and blue circuit builds um, are, are dedicated lines between each other, which eliminates a massive amount of trains when you consider the copper trains, iron trains, circuit trains, and all the other byproducts um, that do not have to go onto the main line and can just go direct between the builds. So if we start, like, It's interesting, example, you even got plastic here too. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that actually is because transporting uh, petroleum is a lot more dense than transporting plastic. So I had considered having the plastic somewhere else and transporting it here, but it actually turns out that it's more train efficient to transport the petroleum like needed for X amount of plastic than to transfer that X amount of plastic on a train onto the main line. And that works with the coal as well? Um, mostly. It does make sense though. Because yeah, because you when get I, too plastic. Yeah. When you look at the builds on the map, so we're sitting in the center of plastic and then there's a red build at the top and bottom of it that the services, the plastic train services directly. Yeah, exactly. And it's a perfect um ratio so so this one plastic train or build supplies exactly these two red builds and it's a nice compact rail network it doesn't it can actually if you zoom in you can see that it only goes in between 
the the two builds. It doesn't go anywhere else. Yep. It's actually handy to zoom in on this because I, I know I've been tracking it for a while and I've been in, I've had the advantage of being in the map before, but I haven't been able to see the, the on the the separate segregated networks up close, and so it's really hard to visualize it if you when you say it and then you look at the whole map zoomed out. You're like, whoa, mm -hmm. this is just track everywhere. But now it makes sense. I'm fixing some of your alerts. It's really quite annoying. Well, that's actually. Uh, interesting to cover you're saying we should cover that about having um getting into practice of putting at least one storage chest in every one of your builds um Zuri was just fixing a thing where there were robots complaining about no storage in one of my builds yeah. four of your builds and those four are probably builds. just four of them that have had things removed no yeah. so one solution to that actually we did a video on it uh, on the mad science map was the my trash train system which automatically mm. remove, which the train goes around and automatically removes uh, any foreign items that are not part of the build and returns them to a central point. Yeah, that can be a really good good system of doing that. Kind of like uh, similar to a fueling system as well. Yeah. Um, as a bit of a teaser, if we're going to look at my map, you'll see something quite a lot more advanced. Oh, for the trash? Yeah. Exciting. Hmm. Something I've been working on is still not quite perfect yet, though. It has problems. Pretty much everything uh, will. Oh, yeah. But that's where the game, the fun of the game comes in. Mm -hmm. It's just refining things, making it better. Interesting. The Blue Circuits build, it has only one inserter per wagon to load. And one red ins one inserter unloading red circuits. Yeah, and that kind of I'm not going to go into all the math because we've already done that and it was boring. Yeah. <laughs> um, but nobody just, nobody watched it. Very briefly, that's just what we were covering in terms of the you know not just spamming down inserters. Uh, there's only one because we only need one. That's the right. The rate if this build produces more inserters would not help because one inserter can load it as fast or faster than the entire build can produce. Yeah, this is a, it's a good practical example of all that dense calculation. And it's tr same true with the, um, the the red circuits because it only needs, what, two red circuits to produce a, um, a blue? And then yeah, exactly. it needs 20 greens, so you want all of your inserters on greens. Yep. And that's certainly something that comes up in previous playthroughs too, where people keep saying, oh, in the comments, people keep saying, "Oh, you just throw more or throw, throw more inserters down. That'll make it faster." And it doesn't quite work like that. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, I mean that pretty much covers this. With the, I'm just zooming back in so people can see the rails. I mean, you'll notice the green circuits are probably the best example of the um, dedicated rails that just go straight over into their respective builds. Uh, same with the iron, and that's actually a huge one because, like, I think, like, three quarters of all these iron smelters are literally just for circuits. And you'll see this massive, like, 20 line system of ore, um, or of plate rather, that goes over directly into each one of these builds. And that's honestly probably like 50 trains that do not have to go onto the main line and clog it up. And it looks like Zuri has wandered down, inspecting the outposts. Yeah, he's made it quite some distance out. Oh, this, you can smell biters, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of this. There, the lords are all gone. Hey. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if only this, um, if only you were to save this map back into the, the main map. If only. But it'll be a better reminder for what I need to do. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at what was written down. I would say those are the more general concepts. And also what we kind of want to do with this series is not only preview other bases, but focus more on builds. Because some of the other, like, builds that are already built, not the, like, boring process of going through them. Um, you know, because some of the questions were, you know, how does a robot smelter work? You know, what, you know, what's a... Uh, an efficient way to unload and load trains within it. 
uh, you know, how to figure out a good train setup for it and, you know, good ways to beacon it and module it. And I think covering those on more of a per build basis and examining one that's already built opposed to spending, you know, four episodes mathing it out is, uh, is a lot better method to do it. And, and that's kind of what we're going to try to include in this reboot as well. Yeah, so essentially working backwards. So starting from the end and working backwards instead of starting from the beginning and working forwards. Yeah, so that's why we're starting here, showing you what you can do and what, you know, we kind of hope to help you be able to achieve. And then we'll kind of wind back down and uh, and then show you each part that goes into this. Uh, just a, as one uh, another point where you can see the, the de dedicated lines, the I just noticed the low density structures is basically identical to the red circuits. Uh, yeah, actually, that's a good point. It is pretty much. So you've got the plastic in the center. It's got basically the identical track arrangement for the plastic shuffling between, and then it's mm -hmm. got the low density structures itself. So although we've only looked at a few builds, you can see there's a high level of um, repetition going on. Yeah. And, uh, and one other important note with these dedicated lines is if you design them in such a way, um, with keeping this in mind, you can actually use them as stackers. You'll notice that except for the lines that come in from the main line um, and like the thing for the speed modules here, aside from those, none of these builds actually have stackers. Yeah, stackers, I actually don't like stackers. I find they're a clumsy solution to a problem that you can solve in other ways. And this is actually a, a better way I find to do it. Right. Um, to yeah. have a a linear stacker or a first in first out type stacker instead of a big block of track where they're all waiting in parallel yeah well pros and cons to everything right. and the, i'd say the con to this approach that i'm seeing here is it is, uses a lot of space and i know supposedly that the map size is infinite but you know you're gonna melt your computer if you build too big yeah, there is such a thing as too big, because the bigger you make the map, the more RAM, the more processing that has to happen uh, within the game. Yep. Yeah, this I'm map isn't trying. nearly big enough to, to approach that yet, so even at this scale, it's fine. But yeah, just be warned. Yeah, it was... Um... I would completely agree <laughs> that, uh, I mean, a ton of effort went into this to make it as compact as possible while using this method. But I would completely agree that if you just did like this type of method or something that required a ton of space um, and just didn't care at all, you would definitely run into issues. The worst person in the multiplayer game is always the one that just keeps on going out exploring more and more map. And you can feel the game just gets slower and slower. Especially have active biters, yeah. and they and they're using a flamethrower out there in the wild. Yeah. Oh, so many bad memories of version thirteen multiplayer, mm. where ev everyone ran at the speed of the slowest person. So I think that covers most of what we um, can show here. Uh, do you guys have anything else you want to point out or mention? Uh, fun little bit of trivia with dedicated lines and point-to-point -point lines. They're the most profitable in Transport Tycoon. They used to be all the rage. It makes sense. I mean, they are very, uh, they're very, very good in Factorio as well. The reason for that is because there's no junction, so the trains can go from A to B unhindered by a train in it, crossing it. And that's why it works in Transport Tycoon, because it gets from A to B the quicker, so you make the most money. That makes sense to me. And I mean, that's what happens here. It's just instead of money, you get, you know, more efficient throughput and uh, production. And once again, Factorio seems to resemble a circuit board simulator on occasion with the way the lines go around. Oh, yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, and all these builds. <laughs> I think we should throw perhaps the throw some um, questions, comments. Um, and maybe we can revisit in a, sometime in the future answering the questions as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we really encourage you guys to leave 
feedback because that's kind of also what prompted us to do a reboot is you know if you have questions with this map specifically leave them below and we can revisit in the future if you have questions in general of any type or feedback please let us know and uh you know we'll definitely take that in consideration and try to uh work around and answer any questions and stuff that there are definitely needs to be more feedback driven yeah yeah that's kind of what we're going to try to add to this is more answering your questions rather than us just blazing forward and not really explaining <laughs> things very well it's just covering what you guys actually are asking and having problems with yeah we didn't exactly prepare a syllabus for this course so you may have to help drive the discussion a bit yeah definitely all right well unless you guys have any final final comments i believe that's gonna do it for uh this first episode of the reboot and uh, hopefully you guys enjoy and uh enjoy the uh the rest of it now catch you later yeah all right catch you later